Welcome to the Dirty Verdict Podcast, where your hosts, trial lawyers Kyle Herbert and Bill Ogden, and mediator Peter Taff, talk with interesting lawyers and break down recent legal news in detail. Here's Kyle, Bill, All and right, Peter. All right, welcome back to another edition of the Dirty Verdict Podcast. I am Peter Taff, and I've got Kyle Herbert, Bill Ogden here as usual, and we are here with special guest, uh, world-renowned trial lawyer, Tony Busby. Thanks for joining us, Tony. Glad to be here, Pete. Uh, Tony is, as, as I know, and Tony, you know, we go back a long way back to law school, first day of law school. Is that true? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. We yeah. walked in. I saw some guy walking around, uh, holding his books up under his arm like that, like a Republican and <laughs> thought he would, he looked like George Bush, like a young George Bush who was going places. So somehow we kind of. I don't know because we came from completely different backgrounds, but for some reason we hit it off. That's right. I, um, you were sitting. You were probably wearing like cut off jeans and a a, a little a hat. I remember your hair was still high and tight because you just came out of the service. Uh -huh. And I remember still. I, I told this story. You looked at me like with the the eyes said, "I hate you so much. I can't even explain." With, it. with great disdain. With great. That's right. But do you st but do you still wear short shorts? I do as much as possible. Yes, and I still look same. 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 Yes, amazing. A lot, a lot has changed. To be honest, no, not no. So yeah, so we go back a long way. Worked together for a long time. Um, did a lot of stuff, and but obviously not everyone listening to this has that same experience. So I'll probably go through some things that I'll ask questions. And Tony, you know full well I know the answer, but not everyone else does. I figured we could. Just tell us to Tony that nobody else knows. All the interviews are all stuffy, and we, I mean, we curse and drink and smoke cigars. Like, tell us, tell us the real story. Well, we'll yeah, we'll get into it. Um, I'm sure you got the yeah, so Yeah, so quick, I mean, just the quick background. We all know uh, you're from Queen City or thereabouts, Texas. Mm -hmm. You often say Atlanta, but I know <clears throat> real stories. Yeah, people, from, people from Queen City get pissed. When I say Atlanta, the people from Atlanta get pissed when I say Queen City. But the bottom line is they're they're one and the same. They're about it's about twenty seven hundred people. Cass County is a is a county of of maybe fifteen thousand people. Uh, with Linden, Texas, as the county seat, which is where the, its claim to fame, of course, was the last individual killed in Vietnam uh, was from Linden. Uh, you'll find that at the at the courthouse. And then, of course, Don Henley is from Linden, Texas. So that's that's the two two things that Linden is known for. And, and Atlanta and, and Queen City, uh, with all due respect to them, is not really known for anything. That's right. And now you are a substantial property owner in that county, Antioch Ranch. Yeah, I think we are the, the largest uh, property owner there now that the paper mill has, has begun to sell all of its land. I think we own more property in Cass County than anybody. Uh, it's mostly um, northeast Texas piney woods uh, with some hardwoods near the creeks, lots of water, uh, lots of white-tailed deer. Uh, Pete and I have spent a lot of time up in those woods. Um, used to kill two or three deer every year. Uh, at some point, I, I decided I'd killed more animals than I need to kill anymore. So now we have preserves. We have um, every kind of animal you can think of, from camels to zebras to every kind of antelope there is, uh, stags, uh, alligators, every kind of waterfowl, every kind of uh, uh, all all of the large uh, running birds. Um, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. We have a um, a lot of nice trails and with large lifted trucks that you can go through. It's kind of like a safari and, and it's a kind of a big deal in Cass County. People come from all over to, to drive the fences and, and look, and it's, it's, it's a really cool deal. What, when people come out there, what, which animal is the one that they kind of gravitate to or most kind of wowed by? Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot, a lot of folks have never seen hardly any of those types of animals. You know, you've seen, of course, nowadays you can see everything on TV, but, um, but uh, I like personally because we rescue a ton of donkeys. That's my favorite. I, lo I love donkeys. Some reason, you know, I'm an ass and I love donkeys. So that makes a lot of sense. But but we also have a lot of art out there, a lot of very unusual art that you can see from the road, uh, a lot of sculptures and so forth that people find interesting. So 
you'd have to ask, you know, everybody's a little different, but, but, uh, on a Sunday, you, you basically have just lines of cars just kind of going slow and I have to have <laughs> security out there all the time because I'm always worried that somebody's going to cut one of the fences or do something stupid. And, uh, so far that hasn't happened and people I think appreciate it. Nice. And you've got a really nice chapel out there too. Got a, got a chapel. Um, I got a lot of different guest houses, have a, a chapel that we've had Easter services in. I had the governor came and gave an Easter service in the chapel once. Uh, it's about a mile and a half from the main house. So it's a nice walk. You can get a nice three mile walk in and you can walk down and meditate. If you like to pray, you can do that. You can see all the, all the, the nature and so forth. Um, there, we got a lot of different walking trails. Me and Francis like to do a lot of walking. Was that Governor Abbott? No, wasn't Abbott. It was Perry. Do you find him to be a particularly religious man? Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah he's very, very religious. Uh, Peter knows him like I do. He's he appointed me to the Regents of A and M. He appointed Peter to the U of H Regents. Uh, he's a, you know, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about him, but but uh, he's a he's a, a good guy. Not not I me. Mean, I don't share the same party as he does. Uh, you know, one time I remember. I've told him this, so this is not a secret, but once I was I was on the reviewing stand watching the Corps Cadets march in uh, at Texas a and This is before I really got to know him, and I was standing behind him, and my, my wife at the time said, man, if I had a baseball bat, I'd hit him right in the back of the head. That's kind of how we felt about him then. Um, then I shared a deer stand with him down in South Texas at the McAllen Ranch for all day long, and I got to know him pretty well and, um, and got to be good. In fact, that was the time that he decided, Pete, uh, to point – to put you on the board of regents of U of H in that deer stand at the McAllen ranch. I don't know if I ever told you that. I may have suggested that Pete, you probably don't know that either. Yeah. That's, we like breaking news. That's good. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, all right. We went, down, we went down to see the, uh, they were, they were, they were, the McAllen ranch does a lot of hunts for, uh, wounded warriors. A lot of people with, uh, missing arms, wheelchairs and so forth. People that have really had a tough go at it. And, uh, but they provide hunts and let them kill trophy deer down there. And so we, they asked us to come down there to join them. We didn't kill any animals, but we spent a lot of time together and got to know each other. And, and um, he had just put me on the board of regents of, of the A&M system. And, and Pete, I think you're probably uh, one of the best regents that he ever appointed. I think you, you probably, and I think he thinks the same thing. Well, good. I appreciate that. I, I tried to honor the choice that he made and that you supported. So I appreciate you saying that, Tony. Um, you, so let me just have, you mentioned that you don't, you, you don't align with the parties with, with former governor Perry. I feel like that's rare now. I'm, I'm interested to see how you think of it because nowadays, if you don't align with your party, everybody thinks the other side's evil versus being okay and being friends, just disagreeing on policy. Do you do that a lot? Or is that just an individual relationship? Yeah, it's a, that's pretty common with me. I mean, um, and it's kind of common in our firm. We have, I was laughing, we were at a, we had about, we have 20 lawyers and when they were all sitting around a large conference room and I was making the joke that some of you are on the right and some of you are on the left and because we got, we run the gamut and I mean, look at this, the Paxton thing, which I'm sure y'all will bring up, you know, I, I certainly don't uh, align with some of his policies and thoughts and so forth, but, but that's, you know, I, I don't take somebody on the raise. I just represent them. And um, with Perry, we always laughed. I told him, you know, you, for 14 years, you tried, it's pretty ironic. You tried to put me out of business for 14 years. Uh, uh, we were flying around in, in, a, in a, my plane. I think we were in Iowa somewhere and the plane broke down. And I said, had you not tried to put me out of damn business, maybe I'd have a better plane. You know, uh, maybe it wouldn't have broken down. Um, so, and I always made sure that when he, got off my plane that I would take a picture of him so I could get the shark on the um, on the tail fin and him getting off of it. And I thought, how ironic is that? He's getting off the shark plane and he's tried to put me out of business. But, you know, and, and, and that, that's one thing I, that Pete and I have talked about a lot. You know, the, the, the people with TTLA and the people that are that, you know, are against tort reform, you know, they want to vilify everybody. And that's not the way you convince people of anything. And that anger is not persuasive, period. Uh, you learn that first, you know, easy. It's the first thing you learn if you're going to be a good lawyer. And, you know, the, the, I always had fits with some of the people from TTLA who, who tried to vilify me because I was friends with some of these people. 
And if they only knew some of the the uh, things that the legislature wanted to do, that Perry even wanted to do during his last uh, term in office that I beat him back on just because I just told him, hey, that's stupid. Let me let me tell you what the long term ramifications of that are. Uh, it's better to be inside the tent than outside pissing it, pissing on it. And uh, sometimes people become such uh, advocates on politics and stuff like that they don't realize that, and they they want to criticize and say, well, look at that. You know, he's palling around with a guy that's you know tort reformer. Well, the, the palling around with a guy that's that's fighting back some bunch of bullshit that while you guys are out there, you know. I guess you feel good about yourself. You're drinking your your red wine at the Four Seasons and talking about how good of a lawyer you are. I'm over here doing something that's that's keeping us all in business. Uh, anyway, you can see that's that's a pet peeve of mine. That's that's kind of what we do here. But so I mean, uh, I, guess, I guess my specific question would be: Is what is the pet peeve? Yeah, pet like, peeves, being to, be, to be on, to be on, to be fair, on one side, the TTLA folks are. If you believe them, they're out there trying to fight for nobody. You know. suggesting they're not. What I'm suggesting is there's a lot, a lot of ways to skin a cat. And uh, when I got the guy, the, the guy's ear that can veto the legislation, probably not a smart move to be criticizing me about it. When I'm trying, I'm in there trying to convince him with reason and not accusations and criticism to do the right thing. I tell you, somebody that that agrees with me, and that's some a guy that I really admire is, is old man Gallagher. You know, he has the same he has the same point of view, which is, you know, he and he and Perry became friendly because Perry liked him and they could sit and talk and actually talk about some of the, the bullshit that was that they were trying to uh, put through the legislature that would really was bad for people and, and bad for our profession and bad for, you know, the things we believe in. And, you know, he and I beat a lot of that stuff back and people never even knew it. Uh, but I guess my pet peeve is to be criticized when you're out there do, doing something that's actually making a difference, that's, that's doing stuff. Because um, I've always said, you know, I don't care. I don't know what the political party is with regard to. I, I care about access to the courts, period. I believe that access to the courts is the only thing that gives anybody a fighting chance. And I'm not suggesting it's equal or fair because it's it's not. There's a judge in Galveston County that told me one time, you want fair, that's where they serve that, you know, you can go get cotton candy and, and look at show pigs. There ain't no fairness. You know, that's a fair. Um, uh, but I believe in fairness and I believe that there should be access to the courts. And and Rick Perry was a staunch advocate against that. He was a strong proponent. He was a TLR guy all the way. He's not anymore. I can promise you that. It took me a while, but I, you know, of course, it's too late. He's not the governor, but but uh, there were some things at the end of his term that he he squelched before they ever got started um, with regard to attorney's fees. Uh, more, I mean, I, I was like, how much more tort reform do you want, Governor? I mean, come on, man. Uh, you know, the, you, you've got to have, people have to have access to the courts. I mean, it's the only chance working people have for a fighting chance at anything. Um, so talking about Perry, so I think... One of the things towards the end of his administration was the fact that he was indicted by what I know you would characterize as a kind of out of control uh, special prosecutor. So obviously you had a relationship with the governor before that, but walk us through how you got hired, how you put together that team. That was your the most recent time you had a high profile situation like the one you're in now. Um, how, how did that go about? And then what was the work involved on taking it ultimately to a dismissal from the appellate courts. I was I was on my way to pick up my kids from Camp Longhorn. I was I was near Austin. He texted me. I I, I had seen the news that he had been indicted. He he texted me and um, he said, can you come over to the governor's mansion? I came over and he said, I want you to lead a team. You, you got carte blanche put together, hire whomever you want, do it however you want. Um, uh, you know, most criminal lawyers will tell you when you're indicted, to shut your mouth. Uh, I took the different approach. I, I, I you know, I, Rick is a, is a really good on the stump speaker, but sometimes tends not to stick to script. So I had to sp spend some time like, look, stick to the script. We're going to have a, we're going to have a speech tomorrow. We have to come out hard on this because a lot of this can be driven by what the public believes about this. And we put together a group of, uh, of legal scholars uh, who were some known to be Republicans, some known to be Democrats. Uh, we we even engaged uh, 
uh, Dershowitz, uh, Harvard to, to, to speak out about it. That's my little dog. Um, he gave a speech, uh, the next day he did a really good job and we started trying to drive the narrative, uh, on the case. And I, I hired some, some really super, super smart people. I hired Baker Botts to do, do the, the, the heavy lifting on the briefing. I, uh, Botsford out of Austin was already engaged. He's a, a very, very good <clears throat> criminal lawyer. And, uh, I, I tried to do everything I could to get the thing, uh, beat back by trying to convince the special prosecutor who's out of San Antonio. Um, I went over, I flew over and talked to him. He wasn't having it. He thought he had himself a franchise case. And I told him, you're never going to, it's never going to go anywhere. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's never going anywhere. And, and luckily I was right on that. We, we had a, uh, when he finally was arraigned, uh, we walked from the governor's mansion with a group of about a hundred people, uh, down to get his, his, um, picture taken. And then we had about three to 400 people uh, at the courthouse steps. And we came out after his booking, he gave a speech. And then we proceeded just to, I mean, I, I filed everything you can possibly file. I tried to, yeah, I made it, I made it very clear that this was going to be a hard road to hoe uh, for the special prosecutor. And I couldn't convince the judge to dismiss it at the trial court level. Uh, the judge at that time was running for the court of criminal appeals. A very smart guy. He's on the court of criminal appeals now. But there was no way he was going to dismiss it. Uh, everybody in Travis County recused. Every judge recused. Of course, the Travis County DA and the entire office recused. Um, and so uh, I, I figured that you know if we had to if we had to go up the chain, we'd eventually get all the charges dismissed, and that's that's what happened. And it took, but it took. You know, I think I, I billed him about three million bucks to do that, and it took. Um, shit, I mean. Pete, you remember probably better than me, probably took a year and eight months or so to get it all right. Yeah. So it was, it was, uh, it was, it was very intense. It was a very intense case and, and cases like that, um, just like this Paxton thing, you know, you got, there's a million three or so lawyers in the country and every lawyer that fancies herself or himself, you know, good, they, they're, they're trying to talk to the, to your client and trying to you know, talk to your client about how you're not doing this right, or you should be doing this. And everybody has an opinion and, and, you know, it's a hard thing to manage. And then you got to manage your client too, because, you know, he, she, he, in this instance, you know, has a, a Rolodex like no other. And as people from all walks of life, whispering in his ear and texting him things and, and you got to be careful what he's texting people back and what he's saying. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough case to manage and it, and it's, it, it, it really, as far as a, if you have an active practice, uh, like, like, like we did or like we do, uh, you know, it's, it's a real time suck, but you know, it, it's one of those things that hasn't, hasn't happened very often in our state. And so, you know, it's like that, that, uh, Patton movie. I always, when I'm talking to my lawyers on cases, I always say, look, you know, think about the, that movie Patton where, he he talks about how you know when your your grandkid is on your knee and and your grandkid says dad or granddaddy what did you do in the great war and you don't want to say i was shoveling shit in louisiana you want to say i was in the middle of it i was in the middle of the fight and uh that's kind of the way i see things so uh i had a little pep talk with my people uh i guess third wednesday or thursday because we do have people on all sides of the political spectrum and there were some some of the people that that were unhappy that our law firm was representing Ken Paxton. And I gave him the same talk. I was like, look, it, 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 we're, we're here representing due process and the rule of law. And, um, you know, when a case like that comes around, uh, you should be flattered to be asked to, to be involved. I remember I started my career at Sussman Godfrey and uh, Steve Sussman was the lawyer, I think when the speaker got himself in some trouble in DC, if I recall correctly, and he was engaged in that, and I was, and, and you know, I, I'm very proud of that. So that's that was the Perry case in a nutshell. It, I mean, obviously, it lasted a long time, but but uh, that's the substance of it. Yeah, it, you kind of touched on some things. So you you've had a long career. You uh, have been involved in a ton of different cases. What what I see from you is the things that I, I mean get you going. I mean, you don't have to work again if a day in your life if you didn't want to. But what gets you going is cases where you see that someone's been treated unfairly 
or they're, you know, they're the underdog who's kind of the, the power is running over them or, and, or, and kind of corollary to that is bully, someone that's bullying. Uh, and that came to mind when I was watching your press conference the other day, uh, just the sense that this maybe hadn't been, at least from your perspective, handled fairly. So why don't you talk about kind of what, if you can, kind of what motivates you these days, what kind of cases get your, your blood going uh, want you, make you want to get up, you know, at 5 a.m., 4 a.m. to to get after it. Every, every it's 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 case specific. I don't have any particular kind of case. I mean, you know, the Paxson case. I think I told you kind of why I'm interested in that. It's because it's it's historic. There was um, there's only been, you know, the, Pete. You may recall that when we were appointed or when I was appointed to the Board of Regents in 2013, Perry also appointed a guy named Wallace Hall to the UT Board, and Wallace Hall gave. Uh, and the, the UT administration fits with FOIA requests and all kinds of stuff, such that the House um, hired Rusty Harden as House counsel, and they investigated Wallace Hall for about nine months. I think they reviewed 150,000 documents. They did four or five public hearings. They invited him to respond, uh, and they ultim the effort ultimately failed. Um, but if you go back to uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, with uh, Paul Ferguson, who was the governor who was impeached, uh, that process went for four months in the House where they developed evidence. They invited him, the respondent, that is he, to appear. Um, they uh, took public testimony. They had he had the ability with counsel to cross-examine, and it was it was it was you know to the extent 100 years ago that it was publicized. At least people had access to to what was happening. In this, in this instance, none of that occurred. In this instance, this all happened uh, over about a 72-hour period with a culmination of a four-hour hearing in front of the, what they call the General Investigative Committee. And in the committee, they didn't bring witnesses, uh, as least as we would expect. They brought the investigators who basically talked about who they had spoken to, who had spoken to other people. So it was multiple hearsay where they, where they presented this at the ninth hour uh, and they presented it in such a way, I mean, as you might expect, it was one-sided and there was no documents and it ended up with an impeachment. So that didn't sit well with me, uh, despite what somebody may or may not think about Ken Paxton. I mean, the guy has been elected statewide in eight different elections. Uh, and, and something that some people don't know is the, the, the entity behind all this, Paxton and Texans for Lawsuit Reform, have had a running gun battle for at least the last two election cycles. Don't ask me why. I don't know why exactly. Uh, if it's a personality thing or if it's a if it's a policy thing, I don't know. But there's a there's a apparently a, a large rift in the Republican Party, the state of Texas, and we see this in any time that one party uh, is uh, is dominating another party, then the party that's dominating begins to fight amongst itself. And that's what's happening. We saw that in, that's why I used to be the Galveston County Democratic Party chair. You know, long time ago, Galveston County was Democrat. And so my challenge was, was the two factions would fight each other. We didn't care about the Republicans because they were of no moment. We won every election. And so, you know, I had to be careful as party chairman who, who I was going to stand next to because I stood next to this person. Well, she, she's part of this faction. And I had to go stand next to this person too so that people wouldn't think that I was somehow in the bag for one side or the other. And so right, what we have in Texas right now is we have, I, I would call them the pro-business Republicans fighting the more ideological Republicans. And uh, Texans for Lawsuit Reform is part of the pro-business Republicans. I mean, I'm just telling you what they claim they are. I don't, I'm not, again, I'm not part of any of that. Um, so, so which kind of Republican are you? I'm, I'm not any of that. Um, but, they want but um so TLR uh who you you if you know anything about me you know I've had a running gun battle with for years who hates me who would who you know wishes I had died as a child I'm sure who, who passed the Busby bill down in South Texas trying to put me out of business down there um they are against Paxton and so they have spent I think they spent I don't know how many millions of dollars in the last election cycle trying to beat Pax and they couldn't beat him. And that's what, and I think a lot of this so, that's happening right now. So to be fair, you see this as an internecine war between Republican factions trying to unseat Paxton? 
no doubt about it. He's a proxy. And, um, and, and then you, you overlay that and without getting too, too heavy into politics here, but you overlay that you have a Lieutenant governor fighting the governor. And, um, and so there's a lot of, before you go too far, to be fair, you've said this is a, a situation where the lieutenant governor is fighting the governor. So which side is Dan Patrick on and which side is the governor on? I think he's talking about that they're having a fight over property tax and how that's going to be structured. They're having a big property tax. That's right. Right now, they're having a big property tax. And, and, and you know, in the past, um, if, if you were just as an outside observer, again, I'm not in, in, involved in any of this, but as an outside observer, you would, you would think that uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, was, would be aligned with Paxton, but, but I don't know if that's the case now. I don't know. I don't know who's aligned with who now. I mean, to the, to the Lieutenant governor's credit with, you know, he's going to serve as a judge in this effort. He's been very quiet about all this. Um, and his son is one of the investigators. Is that, is that accurate? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, no, that's not accurate. Um, Ryan. But, yeah, no. Um, but in any event, I guess the point I'm making is, is that the way this was done, it, it, it it's offensive. It's, it, I don't like the way it was done. And, um, and so that, that kind of moves me and, um, you know, it's going to be a historic, whatever, however it turns out, it's going to be historic. It's going to make precedence. Uh, and it's going to be something that I hope everybody who cares about government, you know, uh, pays attention to. I, I got a quick question. So if, if the process prior to voting for impeachment had gone the way that you described should have gone, do you still take the case? I don't know, because I don't think there'd be an impeachment. I don't think there'd okay. be, a, honestly. Uh, but I think, you know, I mean, anytime you're the attorney general, I don't care where, where, where you are, you know, on the political spectrum, when, the, when there's an impeachment that's only happened statewide once before, and then there was a state district judge that was impeached back in 1975, a Judge Carrillo, where they had a four-month impeachment process where he was already convicted of crimes before they started the impeachment process. And it lasted almost six months in the House uh, before they actually went to the trial process in the Senate. But, you know, no matter where you are on the spectrum politically, uh, this is something that, you know, we go to law school for. This is, this is something that's going to be written about. Uh, it's going to be studied. Uh, it's going to be talked about. I mean, this is, this is, and I'm a real, and Peter will tell you this, I'm a, I'm a real historian. I, I care about Texas history. It's something important to me. And I, I, I'm a student of history and, and I'm glad to just have a role in it, no matter how slight it might be. Yeah, that's actually how we got to be really good friends is we had a shared interest in history of Lyndon Johnson. That's right. And so that's where we, we had all read all the same books cover to cover. And that's how we actually took. Going back to y'all's point on the politics, people who came from extremely different backgrounds got to be friends over that. Uh, go ahead. I will, I will say from the outside, just because even though you don't declare a party in the mayor's race when you did, I think a lot of people think it's common knowledge that you are a Republican. Yeah, I, I, I fought that tooth and nail. I mean, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely socially liberal, uh, maybe maybe uh financially conservative to some degree but um you know i don't know i i i i lost the election and i think everybody realizes this that election was lost years before when trump walked into my house but that's what happened <laughs> uh, Til tillman called me and said uh tillman fertita said hey you know we're looking for a venue because trump's coming to town and and for whatever reason tillman didn't want to do it at his house <laughs> Man, maybe he's a smart smarter guy than me <laughs> and i did it and i, I you know i did it because i just i i thought it was a hoot you know the guy was on um i watched the apprentice i really thought that was a cool show and you know um and that's probably the reason the election was lost uh because if you look at at the things i've done uh, the, the causes I've supported, the people I've supported, you know, I don't think you could, you could pigeonhole me as a Republican. So I've got a kind of a broader question. You've said that you kind of lean towards the small guy, which I respect and appreciate. And that's kind of where I come from. I'm from uh, Friendswood, Texas, kind of your neck of the woods, Galveston County. Mm -hmm. 
And so there are a lot of folks out there that are saying, look, uh, Paxton has avoided justice. He's, he's dodged people coming after him for eight years. Uh, and that he's not the little guy, that he is the uh, overarching power of the state. And that he's just finally starting to get a sense of his comeuppance because the legislature is kind of finally after eight years starting to lean against him. And I'm not going to endorse either side of that idea, but that is certainly what the other side would say about his position right now. What would you say in response to that? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a narrative that has been um, has been pitched. I mean, certainly that's true. Uh, you know, like I say, my my uh, interest in the case is really the historic nature of the case and insisting upon proper process. You know, look, if we want to have a, a trial on 20 articles of impeachment, okay, let's have a trial on 20 articles of impeachment. Guess what? I know how to do that. Uh, but let's do it the right way. Let's don't do it where, where we're going to do it in summary fashion such that we're going to have people who's talked to somebody who talked to somebody else and there's stray comments. There's like, well, forget what the comment was. And I said, well, I was asked about it at one of the press conferences. I was like, well, stand that person in front of me and have, and tell them this is, you know, this is what was said. I mean, that's how it works. That's how, you know, that's, that's what we, we as lawyers, uh, you know, we, we claim we, we support the rule of law. Let's support the rule of law. And, you know, I, I do find it a little bit interesting that, that, some of the people that have been most uh, you know, part of the group of like, put this guy in jail. You know, he's, he's got, he's avoided all this for so long. And, and you know, all that, that crowd are the same people that, that laud people who defend people on death row and all this. I mean, you, you can't have it both ways. You know, if you, if you believe in that. I don't, I don't understand that. What exactly do you mean? Well, a lot of the people that defend murderers, I mean, you hear, you have, there's a group of people said, how can you defend somebody? It's a murderer. Throw him in jail. And, you know, you usually hear the criminal defense bar saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The state has an obligation. The state must prove it. Everybody should get due process, for sure. And that, that includes people you don't like. And that includes people that you don't, that are a different party from you. That includes people that you think badly of. It. And that includes, guess what, Ken Paxton. So I, I think it's ironic that a lot of the people who who are, are most uh strongest opposition to the our, our attorney general are the same people who are beating that drum that I support, which is everybody's entitled to a defense and due process. What What is the process? Have they, have they finalized rules for this impeachment or, or how does that work? Are you a part of it or is the house doing it on their own and they just give them to you? No, the, the, the impeachment of course has occurred. So what we're waiting on now and rules of the process. Yeah. The rules are developed by a rules committee appointed by the Lieutenant governor who I'm told are in Austin as we speak at a resort in a room working out what the rules, which, which resort. <laughs> yeah. We'll go there. Cause, cause, we'll, Cause we will hang out. Yeah. yeah. No, I, yeah, I don't know. And, uh, but I'm told it's on Lake Travis. Uh, I know gotta be horseshoe Bay. No, uh, that's oh. well, yeah. Uh, I'm told um, the 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 committee chair is uh, I'm trying to remember his name, but he's a non-lawyer. But Joan Huffman's on. As, as I understand it, there's a it's a committee of seven senators. Renowned liberal Joan Huffman. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and she, she is. But but don't don't kid yourself. She may not be pro Paxton. Uh, this is this is this is what you know. We don't know where people stand and. Um, but they're going to make the rules, and I don't think I need to explain to lawyers that the rules are going to drive the process. And so we don't know if if they're going to have live testimony. We don't know what the burden of proof is going to be. We don't know. Well, the Constitution guarantees what the burden of proof is, right? No, not in a in, no. No, is that is it just a guess at this point? It's in the exclusive province of the Senate. This is what's hard to get, get our heads around as lawyers is that there are no rules. The rules are being created as we speak here, and they can make whatever rules they want. And the rules might be more likely than not. The rules might be beyond. A, we don't know. We may not have the ability to subpoena witnesses. We may not have the ability to call live witnesses. We may not have the ability. We They may limit us to 10 hours. They can do whatever they choose because it's in the exclusive province of the Senate. Now, there's one caveat to that. 
there, the Constitution uh, does say that the respondent, in this case, the attorney general, was entitled uh, to an impartial jury. And the jury is 31 senators who are present. And the best we can tell, 31 have to be present. Uh, but the question is, for, for lawyers, for, for the things I find interesting are, uh, what does an impartial juror mean? I know what it means when I try cases. I know I know it means that you know I get a chance to to explore with them things that they believe and and have they already made their minds up? If they've made their are minds, are you suggesting that you can disqualify some senators from the jury panel? Because that'd be awesome. I'd love to see that. What the Constitution says. I mean, it depends on what I guess it depends on what the Rules Committee thinks impartial means. But the problem with that is. That's in the Constitution, and, and the, the Senate doesn't decide what the Constitution says. Guess who decides that? That's our Supreme Court. So yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot to this here, a lot more than than it's just okay. Well, these people are Republicans, these people are Democrats, and they're going to vote party. It's not going to happen like that. I can tell you. There's we've already. Well, if it was that. just that, then the Republicans would win, and then the Republicans would have to decide who they want to win. Yeah, and it's not going to happen like that because we already have seen in the House that that a lot of Republicans voted for impeachment. So, so question one to me is: can a can a witness be a juror? Typically, no, but they're going to make those rules. Can can a juror be impartial who has stated publicly that they think Paxton should be in jail? Uh, I don't think that's impartial. Uh, does Lieutenant Governor? Is, sir, I hate to interrupt, Paxton, Mister. P uh, Attorney General Paxton's wife is a member of the Senate. She is part of the jury. Is that fair? That's another thing that the Rules Committee gets to decide. That's, I mean, this is what. Are I'm you going to ask her to recuse herself or what? No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> he, the, the other side? I, I, I don't expect I'll be asking her that. Um, it's kind of like when you're doing a voir dire and, and uh, you know, you're doing a voir dire and somebody starts saying something like all corporations should, you know, should, should burn. You know, I'm going to stop talking to that person and let some. Or are you currently married to one, uh, one of the defendants? Yeah. And, you know, it was my wife and Tony knows my wife very well. And the question would be, if you were trying me for some crime, would you want my wife? Yes, I would I'm want Diana on out. that jury, wouldn't you? Pete, I'm getting her off. I'm getting her off because she's going to def she's going to put you under the jail. Yeah, yeah. She's going to throw the book at Pete. So that. She's a sweet lady. It sounds like y'all have a shitload of unknowns right now. How are y'all going to have everything in process to start by the 27th or 28th of August? We don't know that. That's what, that's what, that's why this whole thing is, 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 it's like we're treading untrod ground here. We don't know anything and we won't know. And, and we're told we'll know Tuesday. We're told that they're going to issue their, next week. yeah, that they're going to, they're going to issue. And that's why you've heard. So here. That's are these is this a committee meeting on Tuesday? They're going to yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're going to um the committee is going to issue what what it believes the rules should be. And I don't think that we're going to have any opportunity to to challenge those, but but I go back to the the one thing I keep going back to is you know that certainly impeachment is the according to the constitution and the government code the exclusive province of the Senate. However, uh, the Constitution does say that the respondent is entitled to an impartial jury and so in, impartial jurors. And so I would suggest that anybody who has made public statements either for or against Ken Paxton, who's who've already essentially made up their minds, because a lot of these allegations, as, as you have suggested, have been floating around for a long, long time. And a lot of politicians have made comments on them. I don't think people that have made those comments can be impartial. So we'll Are you, what happens if you run out of senators? Well, it doesn't say that you have to vote. It just says of those present. And, you know, you can you can push the white light and just be present and not take a position. So we'll see. Okay. All this is all this is is new, uh, which is why it's so historic. You would think we'd be prepared for something like this. It, it seems like inevitable at some point it's going to happen. But eh, I don't know. Avoiding you know, it didn't codify it. As somebody that cares about government, which I know you do, uh, think about this. You know, right? right. Now, yeah, I know. It's Ken Paxton who a lot of people, you know, there's a group of people that that just don't like Ken Paxton for all kinds of reasons. Um, but next time it could be anybody else. I mean, if 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 it can be done like this, they can take out any stuff. But so 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 Tony, to be fair, one of the allegations 
is that he has limited the ability to investigate and try these cases, which has kept him in office. So when you say, you know, this could all be applicable to somebody else, th the response is, yes, but he has limited the ability of the people to understand what he's involved in by his political power as maybe the third or maybe second most powerful politician in the state. Is that fair? I don't think that's a fair statement that you just made. I, I would say this, I mean, I, you know, Cogdale, who I think is a great lawyer, who, who's been involved in some really good cases and, and has done really good work, has handled the securities case. And that's that's the allegation, is that, he's, that, that Paxton somehow delayed and stifled the securities case. And that's one of the articles that he has, he has he has done things that he shouldn't have done in that case. Well, the truth is, you know, that's what Cogdell's got, got his back up on that. I mean, he's like, wait a minute, I've defended that case. And every delay in that case, we have not moved for one continuance. Every delay in that case has been the, the two special prosecutors fighting about trying to get paid. That's been the delay. And that case has been going on for almost a decade. It's been going on because Brian Weiss and the other special prosecutor have not been able to get some court, some some county government somewhere to pay their bills. And, you know, I, that's really been the delay. So that's an easy one to, to dispose of. That's a, that's one of the easy ones. Um, there's some other ones, um, you know, that somebody paid for his house renovations. Well, I have the receipts and nobody paid for those. And that's, that's easy. And, and, and that's the point I've made. Had you just, had you let the man know that, that you guys were doing this, he could have, we had a, they had a package. I wasn't involved at the time, but they had a package that they would have delivered, which we we have done, and uh, we tried to do it as an example in the in the Perry case. Uh, Bodsford had a had a package that he wanted to give to the grand jury, and they wouldn't let him do it, uh, which probably would have prevented the indictment in the first place. And uh, but anyway, without getting into the 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 ins and outs of the because it's twenty, we would be here for hours upon hours. Uh, it's going to be a historic case, and it's going to be. Uh, I think it's going to be something that's going to set a lot of press. Can, can I ask one more very short question? Mm -hmm. So the folks that have aligned against Attorney General Paxton are primarily Republican, a handful of Democrats. Does that in and of itself give you any concern that the majority of the folks who are lined up to attack Senator Paxton, sorry, not a senator, Attorney General Paxton are of his own party with just a handful of Democrats. Does that give you any pause or concern? I have pause and concern about the whole thing because I want to win because I think he should win. So, you know, yeah, I mean, d d if, if it was straight party, he wouldn't have been impeached. So, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen in the Senate. Senate's a different animal, as you know, than the House. So if the rules come out and they're, you, you, you take a look at them and you say, this is horseshit. Do, is there, is there a, an avenue to get to the Texas Supreme Court to interpret on an interlocutory basis, or you got to go through the whole process and then do it? I don't know. I, I think nobody knows, right? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. This has been, this has been fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Tony, I, I, really, I really appreciate you coming on and giving us your, your best. Done, yeah. Oh, sorry. Whoa, ho, ho. We got, we got all kinds of... Hey, Dave, you can go. We're so well, I was just going to say, I really appreciate your candor. This, this has been fascinating, but... We're going to ask some more weird, super crazy questions. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, no, last question. Um, are you expecting to get some kind of timeline on Tuesday as well, or do you know? I, I, you know, the scuttlebutt we get, you know, we don't know if the rumors we're hearing are true or not. You know how politics is. We hear things from other people, uh, you know, different. We don't know how politics is. We, we, don't, we just don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, presumably, just like we do in a regular case, you get a docket control order, a scheduling order that says, Here's how this is going to work. But that's yeah. only like partially enforceable at this point, right? Like who knows? And we know, you know, the, 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 our, our uh, state government only meets, you know, a certain amount of time. So there's things that has to happen at a certain time. And then there would have to be additional sessions. I think this, if we're going to do, if we're really going to try 20 articles of impeachment with no summary disposition, uh, then we're going to be there for a long time. I was going to ask, how long do you think it's going to take? Just if you have any idea at all. Well, a two part question. Are you opposed to starting on August 28th? And two, how long do you think it'll take beyond August 28th to get there? 
Well, we got to start by August 28th. That's that's a must. It has to start. Now, how long it lasts, if, if that's just going to be, you know, we're going to do some pretrial stuff, we're going to do some summary disposition, but, but if we're going to have a trial, six months probably, I would expect. Every day. Does the indictment of Mr. Paul speed this up, shorten it, or no impact whatsoever? None that I can see. I mean, I read the indictment. It has nothing to do with Paxton. All right, sir. <clears throat> Turn in the page to a right. other topic. No more Paxton. Other topic. Let's talk about camels again. So uh, got heavy. So Tony and I each have four children, uh, roughly the same age. Um, all mostly post college. Some still in college. As you know, I think the odds of any of my kids being a lawyer is about zero. Mm. Um, Based on how they are or their intelligence and genetics? No, they're yes. intelligent. <laughs> uh, they Two have, of them are real smart. Yeah. Um, yes. But so mine are not doing that. Do you, uh, it, your four kids are all doing great. Are any of them, you have any prospect of them, them being lawyers? I think the last one, the redhead, I think I got a good shot with him. He's, he's Robert. Robert. Yeah, I think he he uh, I think he's heading in that direction. I hope. So you want your you you, you want your kids to to go into law? I would love my I'd love all of them too, but but I don't. I, one's a social worker. One's uh, going into real estate. One's going to be a veterinarian. And Robert, my last one's probably my best hope. So I'm I'm the complete opposite. I got one. He's eight, and I I told him, hey, I will pay your rent as a 35 year old struggling singer songwriter in L A. As long as you don't go into law, I had a daughter. In it. We had, I had a daughter that went to USC in the theater program, and she went to New York and and was a struggling actor for about six months. And she came home one day, and we were sitting in my study, and she said, "Dad, I don't think I want to take the the subway at four a.m. in the morning and sit stand in line for three hours, and then you know in five minutes they say you're not what we're looking for." And she just got tired of it, so she then she chose. NYU, you know, she chose the most expensive school in the country and the second most <laughs> school went to NYU, got her social social work uh, degree, master's. And now she just told me recently, Dad, I don't think I want to be a social worker anymore. So I don't know what she's going to next, but I don't think it's going to be the law. Oh, that's what I, I thought she was maybe going to do that. I would love that. She would be great at it. She's got a kind heart. She's She's conscientious. And that's, I think that's what makes a good lawyer. All right, so some of these, some of the listeners are younger lawyers. Um, you started, her first job was with Judge Kent, and then you went, it's Sussman Godfrey, but then very quickly um, joined a smaller plaintiff's firm and then went on your own. So for the young lawyers who are having that debate of when's, when's the right time, what do I need to know before I, can I do it? Uh, how did that calculus work for you on going out on your own? I was, I was working out of a strip center in Friendswood. And, uh, we go Mustangs. Yeah. And I didn't have a, um, I didn't have an office. I was in a little bullshit conference room. They didn't even have a space for me, but I was, um, I was taking a deposition of a HR rep. I, when I got there, he gave me 13 cases. Everyone, I mean, as you might imagine, you know, he needed help. This was a solo. He needed help. And he gave me the most dog shit cases he had. And, uh, most of them offshore cases and, uh, when he, when he offered me that job, I remember sitting with, um, at Sussman Godfrey on the 53rd floor of, of, uh, what was at that time, I think the first interstate building. First, first interstate. Yeah. And, uh, he, yeah, my buddy there was, had been the managing editor of the Yale law reviews of a smart, smart guy. Um, and I was, we were trying to go through the numbers like, you know, I think I could make a living doing this. Is there possible I could do this? And I finally just went to the bank and said, and they gave me a hundred thousand dollar line of credit. And I went out there with uh, Richard Melanson, what's the guy's name? Uh, really, really good guy. And uh, he basically let me do whatever I want. And I started developing business, but I was taking the deposition of an HR rep. And I was trying to establish that had this guy worked for some other company, maybe he would have had a, a, a better uh, progression of, of salary. I was trying to establish a damage model for, for you know, his but for damage model in, in the delta between his injury and and had he continued to work. And this HR rep told me, uh, no, he wouldn't make any more money at this other company. And I said, wait, 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 what are you talking about? It's like, 
Well, no. Uh, if he went to Rowan or if he went to Falcon or he went to uh, Diamond Drilling, he would make about the same. And I said, well, how the devil could you possibly know that? And he said, because we meet once, uh, twice a year, and we share wage information. And I, I said, wait a minute. It's not an interesting part. Explain. <laughs> I say, explain that to me. And uh, he, he, uh, he said, yeah, we, we, yeah, we lost you a little bit there when you're talking about if he went to any other place, he would have been paid the same. And you asked, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? And he said, because we meet and we exchange wage information. And I said, where do you, tell me about these meetings. He said, well, sometimes we meet in Paris and sometimes we meet in New Orleans. We've met in Bahamas and, and uh, we bring our wage lists that, you know, from the roustabout all the way up to driller, what they make. And, and I said, why, the, why do you do that? He says, well, because, you know, you offer these guys, these guys from South Louisiana a dollar, a dollar more an hour, they'll jump ship and they'll go somewhere else. And we don't want that to happen. And uh, because, you know, we invest a lot of time, effort, and money in these guys. And so I, I finished that deposition. I went home and I was like, there's something screwed up about this. There's got to be something here. So I convinced Richard to, uh, I said, this is an antitrust violation. It had never been done before. But it was it was kind of the negative inverse of what we typically see with people price fixing widgets. They were basically price fixing uh, wages to to artificially depress the wage the wages of these offshore workers. And I filed the case, and it just sent shockwaves to the offshore drilling industry. A little old guy in a strip center, and we filed that suit. And you know we had VE and Beck Redden and Baker Botts and every you know every law firm you can think of all the big boys involved and all of a sudden I became the uh, the the most popular guy around you know I went to Cafe Annie and drank a lot of nice wine and they uh, Redden who's God rest his soul was one of the first ones that approached me and took me out and, and served me nice Pinot Noir and and you know and I started figuring out it's like man I must be onto something because these guys really they wouldn't give me time a day otherwise but all of a sudden I'm I'm cause celeb here. And VE was the first one to settle their part of the case. They settled for $8 million, and then the next one was $9 million, and the next one was $10 million, and it got all the way up to $15 million. I had a pot of about $75 million bucks. And I remember standing in front of Judge Lake, uh, who was a, a fine judge, asking for a 30% fee. And at this point in time, you know, I was living in, in, in uh, Falcon Ridge uh, in Friendswood. Uh, with- There's no, no shame in that. No, no shame. shame in that. No shame in that game, and um, and uh, I and the judge says, you know what, Mr. Busby, I'm I, I I'm very impressed with this. You know, I'm not going to give you a thirty percent fee because I don't want you to be out on a yacht. We want to keep you in the law practice. I'm going to give you a twenty five percent fee, and I walked out of there with an eighteen point six million dollar fee, and I knew then that that I wasn't going to be in a strip center anymore, uh, and so I ditched Richard. Uh, he got his portion of the fee and he retired. Uh, and then, you know, I was off on my own. And shortly, shortly after that was in 2001, I'd been practicing the two and a half years. And, and then, in, as you might recall, March 23, 2005, the BP plant blew up in Texas city. And we represented, uh, about, I think I represented about 280 people from that. And that case ended up settling for something right under 500 million. And we were off and running. And uh, I'd probably still be in Galveston, but for Hurricane Ike in 2008. And since then, you know, we'd just been blowing and going. Pete, Pete and I represented the uh, the Basque country in Spain, uh, state of Louisiana, every every municipal government, county government, all, all over te- Texas. Uh, we just, you know, just kind of, instead of just saying, okay, I'm happy where I am. Let's, let's keep plugging and keep pushing. And, um, now here we are. And what I get the most pleasure out of now is watching you. You can always identify those lawyers in, in your group. And I've always, Pete will tell you this, there's Busby satellites all over Texas, people that worked with us who figured out how to do it, figured out how to make money and and wanted to be their own person. And I never once have been offended by that or somebody who says, you know what, I'm going to go off on my own and do my own thing because I'm proud of that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I can still identify. I, I know the ones now in my firm, got about 20 lawyers and I know there's two or three of them that like, I can see that, that sparkle in their eye and that fire in their belly that, that probably will do the same thing. And, and I, I, I really, really like that. We, we had Ryan Pig on a few weeks ago 
Oh my and he God. said that the only thing that's holding him back is having to work for you. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> now we've had on. Did he tell you he had a Ferrari? Uh, he did. He did. I had to. He I had to. To, 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 be, to, to be fair, Tony, we've had several of your lawyers on, and they all speak incredibly highly of you, which is which is really flattering. Let me tell you something offensive to me. I, I, Pig <laughs> buys a Ferrari. I get a text from uh, Lance McCullers, and he says, "Hey, did you just pass me?" And I go, "No." He said, "Don't you have a, a whatever this kind of? I don't know a lot about Ferraris. Uh, do you have one of these Ferraris?" I said. No. So I text, I, I um, texted, um, anyway, I was trying to wonder, like, who has a Ferrari like that? Who has a Ferrari? Well, then my guy that washes my cars told me that Pig had a Ferrari. Pig had that Ferrari for over six months and didn't mention it to me. And then I started thinking, maybe that boy's being paid too much. <laughs> That's I, why I, I think didn't mention it. You've definitely got to reduce his salary by at least 25%. Great. Uh, okay, well, last topic. Last topic, this is a point of interest. You referenced the Basque country. I bet you there's very few lawyers in the country that have been invited to and have spoken at the Havana Bar Association. Yeah, like two weeks after we spoke there, they all got arrested. That's right. Really, okay, so so for the audience and for these guys who may not know, how did that come about? You spoke at the Havana Bar Association. Yeah, we, we were... we. We're working on the case with a Spanish lawyer in, in Bilbao in San Sebastian, a really good lawyer who had a second family in Cuba, which was, I guess, we, we didn't know this, but was pretty common for people to have a, a family in Spain and then a, another family in Cuba. And he was real high on Cuba, and he kept trying to get us to go to Cuba. And, and I said, well, I don't know, man. And and, and uh, we finally arranged, he said, he, he arranged this the Havana Bar Association wanted us to come and make a presentation, which we did. It was just a fun, fun time. We had a great time. And then we learned that, uh, that I guess it was back when Castro was still around. Two, about two weeks later, the entire Havana Bar was arrested. Uh, not because of us, but just... Oh, okay. I was about to say, geez. No, we didn't. It wasn't like some huge party. It was just like, you know, they, they you know, if you want to, you know, first kill the lawyers, as they say, you know, that's that was kind of the idea. I'm just glad that I'm not the only one with a second family in Havana. So <laughs> I learned something today. So hold on. To be fair, it's you, me, Pete. Not me. Pete's only got half a family. And I, I, like, I'm not a hundred percent saying that uh, Benny has a family in Cuba, but Same probably thing. no. Okay. Well, you guys want to ask any more questions before we let Tony go? I got one more, but I'll defer to you guys. Yeah. I, the only question I was going to ask is, who's the best defense lawyer you've ever gone against in your mind? Hmm. Kathy Patrick is one. I don't know if you know her. She's very effective. She, uh, when I represented Tillman some time back when he was fighting his creditors and she's with Gibbs and Bruns or was, I haven't seen her in ages, but she came down there and she just, I mean, she was impressive. Um, and then um, trying to think, they're all, I mean, without being casting aspersions, they're all about the same. Um, you no, know, yeah, they're dicks. I hate them, but. Uh, they're all they're all they're all idiots. No, I'm just I, I disagree with this. If why? Yeah, well, you know, I I like of course I have a great affection for Daryl Barger just because he's a Marine and I'm a Marine and and uh, he's he's when he knows it that I've got him he just he just does the right thing. Uh, there's others uh, even you know he probably would be surprised I I said this but Will Moy is one that that he knows when I got him he'll usually just come correct. Uh, but you know, there are just like in the plaintiff's bar, there's some real jackasses out there that are not fun to deal with. And so the corollary of that are who are some plaintiff lawyers that you've worked with or seen that you respect, uh, their abilities? Um, you know, you can't argue with results. I mean, the, the Arnold Itkin guys are did, doing amazing work. They must be, uh, they, they're doing, they're getting outrageous verdicts, which I love. Uh, obviously Mark Lanier is, is a, is a hellacious lawyer. I'm, I'm very fond of Michael Watts just because we're buddies and we tried a lot of cases together. Uh, and a young man with a bright future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but those are probably the guys that, like, if I didn't, you know, I've told my wife, if, if you know, if I get hit by a bus, you know, these are the guys to call. I, the thing about Michael Watts that I love is as soon as he got the not guilty, he did, like, a 
presentation. He did a bunch of presentations about the <laughs> criminal process. And it was two middle fingers to the justice. One hundred percent. Shouldn't have fucked with me. And I, he was like, if I wouldn't have twenty five million or whatever it was to spend all the never by the I would I would I'd be in prison. And he was it was a it, it meant something, but the way that he did it was I loved. It's hundred percent true. He's a brilliant guy. When we we tried a lot of cases over in New Orleans, Pete, I think obviously you were involved in that. And uh that's one of those cases where I came to Pete and says, We're gonna make a billion dollars here. And Pete, of course, <laughs> And, and threw it in my face every time, you know, when we settled for fifty million or whatever it was. But um, well, I learned a lot. I hate those. I hate those fifty million dollar settlements. Ugh, no, I hear those. Hell, we learned a lot from Watts. I think I learned a lot from him uh, in the way he he does things. I've heard a lot of great things about Lanier's Trial Academy. You know, I have. We all have our own way of doing our things, and for those guys to share that, I mean, that says a lot about who they are. You know, I I. I, I got a lot of little tricks up my sleeve that I don't like to share, and those guys seem to be very willing to to do that. And um, one of these days, you're going to share them with guys like me, and we're going to get so pissed when we learn them that you held them this long. I, I don't know. I may not have really anything other than just you know just just keep beating the you know beating with a baseball bat or drop cans on people's heads or things like that. <laughs> All right, so from 1995 to 2011, I went to every Texas Texas A&M game, home or away. We're meet we're meeting we're meeting back up in 2024. Thousand bucks, you want to take the Aggies or the Longhorns? I'm taking the Aggies all day long. My question is, is my godson going to be playing, Pete? That's the question. Yeah, so. That was going to be my question. You're not going to root for number thirty. I'm going to root for my. Horns. I'm going to root for my godson, but I'm going to hope that his team loses. Okay. Well, so, so, but, but, so we can we can lock this in thousand dollar bet between the dirty verdict and you. Whoa! Wouldn't that, don't drive me into this. One thousand dollars. Book it. Thousand okay. dollars. Kyle Herbert, Tony Busby. Aggies versus Longhorns 2024. And we appreciate the invite to your suite. We're flattered. <laughs> we will be there. Book it. Even up, though. I don't care what the line is. Even. Even. Straight straight up, even bet. Uh, yeah, so, no, my son, Lord willing, should still be playing uh, next year. So, hopefully, we'll be on the field. I got darn people. That'll be historically. Well, I mean. I, you <laughs> I, saw that boy, I saw that boy in the state championship. That's a player. Great play. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, All right, absolutely. Thanks, man. All Thank right. you so much for showing up, Tony. Really appreciate it. And uh, anytime we want to come back on, we'd love to have you. Thank you so much. Awesome. See you. All right. Wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us this week. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also visit our website at www.dirtyverdict.com. If you are interested in coming on as a guest, or have a story idea, please email us at story at dirtyverdict.com.